Wednesday, December 22nd. It's the Just Baseball Show. I'm Arm Layton. He's Colby Olson joining us again. You're, you're in the fold here a lot more now. You're, you're basically like the number one alternate, like sixth man off the bench, Tyler Hero, if you will. Colby, thanks for being on. And we're going we're gonna to talk some Reds prospects because this is something we've talked about a lot together. Hunter Green versus Nick Lodolo. We're going to talk about that a lot. Uh, but we're also going to go through the system as well. But the Hunter Green Lodolo conversation, you and I have talked about so much, and I'm really excited to kind of get it on on record uh, and have some people kind of get some, share their thoughts with us about it. Excited to be on, man. Excited to be on. We've been talking about Lodolo versus Hunter Green since before the Futures game, but we saw them live at the Futures game this past summer, and that was a big topic of discussion because – we saw Lodolo and went, is this guy really, is he, is he the best pitcher in base or in the minor leagues? Maybe <laughs> he, it was a conversation, right? Like, and then Shane Boz came in. Uh, but, but that, that was the crazy thing is we, we were looking at, at what Lodolo was doing. I was like, you can't find a better lefty than this right now. I mean, there, there just isn't one. Uh, but before we get into that, what do you think of the Tyler hero comp? Are you okay with that? Tyler Hero, that that's fine. You're going to give me the hard time with the Tyler Hero slander I was giving you earlier in the year. Um, maybe more of a Patty Mills. Patty Mills. Oh, you'd rather be Patty Mills than Tyler Hero? <laughs> uh, There's no well, song about me yet. Yeah, exactly. Jack Harlow song and you're in business. I actually thought that that was going to be the beginning of the end. Uh, as a Heat fan, I was like, oh my gosh, this is why. It's all getting to his head. It's over. Uh, but he's back. Uh, but I had to always throw that in there. Jack always throws in a little basketball in the beginning. I figured Kobe's first guy off the bench is frequent on this podcast, getting buckets every time, Tyler Hero. Uh, but by the way, you can check out the full top 10 and then some, this is definitely the longest top 10 I've ever written. Uh, I don't know why, because it's not like the red system is, is the most exciting in the world. I mean, I love the two guys at the top. There's some interesting guys that you and I are going to get into, especially Ellie De La Cruz, who is by the way, the, like I I've been aware of this guy for a while, but until I really went into it for a few hours, watching video, digging back, looking at some of the batted ball data, I was like, this guy's a freak. Like this guy could actually be a top, 50 prospect in baseball if it all kind of comes together for him next year like he's there's a select few guys that it can be outside of the list though I think he's gonna get some consideration in our top 100 update to be in the back end but there's a select few guys that are not on the list that I could be like yeah they might just skip 50 they might go from just not on the list to top 50 and as crazy as that sounds there's some players like that because they have all these tools we just haven't seen enough and then they put it together and it's like okay He's skipping 50 guys and Dilla Cruz could be that guy, but we got to start with the pitchers. And by the way, the write-ups are embedded. The article is embedded in the description of the podcast or in the description of the YouTube, depending on how you are uh, consuming this podcast. But we got to start with Nick Lodolo. Uh, and this is my number one guy. And I really was a bit surprised Colby because I didn't think it was as much of a debate, I guess, than it seems to be. Uh, I didn't get any like pushback from Reds fans. I just got a lot of, wow, really? Um, and, and that was surprising to me because I, I think as far as we're concerned, and it's not an indictment on Hunter Green, it just seems like Nick Lodolo is just very far and away and clearly uh, not only the best pitching prospect in that system, but one of the best pitching prospects in baseball period and has the combination of the upside. And I think I said it in my write-up, it's so rare to have, an incredibly high baseline and then still an extremely high ceiling. Like what else do you want from a dude? Uh, and Nick Lodolo is exactly that. Yeah. And I think you bring up a great point that I think the flashiness of Hunter green is what grabs people. They see a 102 mile an hour fastball and that's what they go to immediately and expect that to carry him above Lodolo. The thing with Lodolo is that he has that two seam movement with the filthy slider and, you know, I can name so many guys that now have that, that are turning into aces in, in major leagues. We have Tanner Houck, you have Logan Webb. And as you mentioned in the article, Lodolo's pitch movement compares directly to Taylor Rogers, which he's a, he's a reliever, obviously. But if you have Nick Lodolo pairing movement with a reliever that is considered to be, in my opinion, a top 10 reliever in baseball, and he's going six innings and he has a changeup as well. There's no doubt that this guy can come in immediately at the major league level and produce elite ace level numbers. And I, I believe that. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm with you hundred percent, man. Like when, when you have the movement profile and the stuff profile, like you said, of a reliever, except he has plus command, right? Like this guy pounds the strike zone as well. He doesn't walk anybody. And that's where it's even more insane to me. I mean, it was disappointing that we saw the season cut short. It wasn't by any extreme injury. It was shoulder fatigue. And you're always going to be you know, a little bit careful with, with your golden egg. And remember, there was no season in 2020. So each player was, was affected a little bit differently. And Lodolo just seemed to you know fizzle out a little bit earlier, only through 15 and two thirds innings. I'm sure he could have came back if they really wanted to push it. If he was a big leaguer uh, and they were making a move for the postseason. Uh, I'm sure he could have made it happen, but he's a prospect and they weren't. And I think that's why they kind of felt like, hey, let's let's take it slow. But even in those 15 two thirds innings, a 2.31 ERA, and this is between double A and, and a little cameo in triple A. That was about five or six innings where he struggled. Uh, and, and that was something, too, that people asked me, like, are you worried about that? I'm like, no, not worried about that at all. <laughs> it was only a handful of innings. It's no big deal. Uh, if you can pitch the way he did in double A he would have, he would have been fine in triple A. The only thing that usually happens is sometimes you see the the home runs tick up a little bit in triple A, a lot more hitter friendly parks. They're using the MLB balls. Uh, these hitters are a bit, bit more experienced in the, and they'll, you know, capitalize on mistakes. But overall, if you have great numbers in double A, you're, you're going to translate to at least very, re, very respectable numbers in triple A, but 15, two thirds innings, 2.31 ERA, 2.09 FIP and a whip below one. And the most important thing here is you're not going to find very many, better K to BB distributions, 39% K rate, which is just stupid. He's striking out almost 40% of batters and only walking 5% of batters. I mean, when you have that combination, right, we're talking about the stuff, you have reliever stuff, but you are pounding the strike zone and getting weak contact. That's what I really like, because when you look at somebody like this and the, the struggle in today's game is, I mean, part of the reason why we don't see guys go deep into games is one is, is, you know, a lot of the numbers say don't go around the third time. But I think the other side of it, too, is that just pitch counts get up there so quickly. Right. So much swing and miss. Everyone's going for the strikeout. Nobody's really pitching to contact because why would you? It's terrifying. Guys crush the ball now. Uh, it's really hard. But having a guy that can kind of get out of certain uh, hitters counts and get out of situations and ex- stretch out their outings by getting ground balls or getting ground balls early in counts. Like that's where you get the Sandy Alcantara's of the world that can go seven, eight in, that are so rare in today's game. And I feel like Lodolo can be that, that little duality there where it's, you know, great stuff, big swing and miss, but also can pitch to some contact with that two seamer you talked about and, and get outs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what makes his arsenal? Uh, you touched on it a little bit, but what makes it so hard for these guys to hit? Is it the, is it the way he's able to locate it? Is it the, because for me, I have my thoughts on it. Uh, but we talk about tunneling, you know, the two seamer going this way and then the, the slider going this way, the way he's able to command it. You know, what, what else kind of stands out to you as to how he's able to get so many swings and misses uh, on top of the ground balls? Yeah, it's it's absolutely that tunneling factor that you bring up. If he just threw two seams, I think it would he would still be effective. But obviously having to view the two seamer coming in on your hands as a lefty. And then a slider sweeping away from you, but it comes out of the same tunnel. Exactly. Like I cannot, this is a guy that I cannot wait for Rob Freeman pitching Ninja to just have an amazing time with, because he's going to get some ridiculous swords in, in the MLB. Oh yeah. And, but the other thing going back to the ground balls, the reason I love Lodolo so much is I was talking to the, about this with you before the pod and Great American Ballpark is basically, it's not on the level of course field, but it is close to being on the level of course field where it is impossible to pitch in that park. And I was looking at some of the home road splits for, so we have Sonny Gray, for example, he has a 4.89 ERA, 4.73 FIP at home. He goes away a 3.44 ERA, 3.2 FIP. Then you have Tyler Ma, uh, Mal, Molly, I, Molly, I, I, get, I get corrected on that all the time. Tyler Molly, I guess I went oh. on a red, I went on a red show and, <laughs> and, and then I was like, I've, I've said his name so many times, but it wasn't until I was on the red show. I was like, Oh no, am I going to get roasted here? Uh, Tyler, Ma, Ma, Molly, Molly, <laughs> anyway, continue yeah. point stands, <laughs> whatever. So he has a 5.63 ERA 5.16 FIP at home, 2.3 ERA 2.76 FIP 
on the road. That's crazy. So what I found there, though, is that Luis Castillo has the opposite splits. At home, he has a 3.1 ADRA, a, th- uh, a 3.42 fifth. On the road, a 4.35 ERA, a 4.16 fifth. And that makes no sense to me. But then you brought up, well, he's probably, he's a ground ball pitcher. He probably throws more ground, he gets ground balls at home and that's what he's focused on. And you're absolutely right because Sonny Gray is all about fly balls. He, he yep. gets some, like he's split 47% ground balls, but a lot of fly balls. Tyler Molly, on the other hand, all fly balls, all fly like balls, 40% yeah. fly balls and gets hammered at home. Now, Lodolo is the perfect pitcher for the Reds because he gets 56% ground balls. That's in AAA, but I would expect that number to you know, remain the same going into the majors. Hunter Green is the opposite. He is a fly ball pitcher, and I think that's, a, that's just something to add to the narrative of he might struggle a little bit in Great American Ballpark. And if he was pitching for another team, he might have the advantage of, okay, he's pitching in Comerica Park or somewhere else where fly balls are not as – you know, the, the value, the value of pitching at great American park, great American ballpark is tough. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that I, I, it's a great segue into Hunter green here because, you know, Hunter green has generational ability and you have though, at the big league level, a little bit of, of an example of who pitches well there and who doesn't in Cincinnati, the same way that you get in Colorado, which is even more extreme because you've got to find a very rare couple people that can pitch there. Like you were telling me a, a couple of weeks ago, like Herman Marquez is just built for Colorado and, and that's why they may never let him go. Like when they get somebody that can pitch at altitude, they'll never let him go. It's that's where it's not that extreme in terms of affecting their arsenal, but it does affect you because you can't get away with a lot of the things that you can get away with in other environments. And Hunter Green, that is the big problem is, is the long ball. And, you know, I think a lot of people look at the stuff and they see, oh, he throws 103. Um, he, he has a, a nice slider. He's going to figure it out. And, and I don't disagree. I don't disagree at all because context is also important with these guys, right? And, and Hunter Green is still a top 20 prospect in baseball. He is still somebody that I'm extremely excited to see continue to develop. But in, in relativity here, I just don't see how you can go with him over, you know, Nick Lodolo. But one important point on Green is that entering this season, not only had he not pitched at the professional level since 2018, he had only had about 72 innings under his belt professionally. I know it seems like he was drafted forever ago and he kind of was, but he's still only 22 years old. He was drafted second overall in 2017. I don't care about how many years he's been in professional baseball. As you and I know, it's all about how many innings you have thrown, just like it's how many at-bats you have under your belt. And Hunter Green is still very young in his professional career and has already made it to AAA. So this isn't us saying that Hunter Green isn't going to be great. Heck, he could end up being better than Nick Lodolo, and that wouldn't surprise you or I at all, right? But I think the most important note here is, is that we're ranking prospects as to where they are now and also projecting their future. Lodolo, to me, is guaranteed to, to be that solid, at very worst, number three. I think is, is you got a very high chance at a number two. And, of course, a good shot at being an ace if he puts it all together even more so. Whereas Green, we still have some wider ranges of outcomes just because he has not shown us enough yet and he hasn't even hit the 200 inning mark or might just be encroaching on the 200 inning mark uh, in his professional career. The, the big thing here with Hunter Green is, like you said, the long ball. Keeping it in the yard is the struggle. And this was a guy that it was really fun for me to dive into because I'm sending you info on his fastball and I'm like, why is this getting hit out so much? It's not as flat as people make it out to be. It does flatten out sometimes, but I felt like people were really knocking on the quality of the fastball. And it's not really as much that as we were talking about it. It's really the fact that he throws it 66% of the time. I mean, when you're an experienced hitter, and and this is where I kind of got into it with Green is I was like, Okay, if I'm facing Hunter Green, what's my approach? Well, first of all, I'm not I'm not catching up to it no matter what. But in a world where I can catch up to 103, which all these guys can, what's my approach? And realistically, I'm just selling out for the fastball because I'm looking for the fastball middle and, you know, maybe a little bit above belt high. And I know that there's a two in three chance, There's like literally a two out of three chance that he's going to throw that pitch. 
If he doesn't, it's going to be a slider. I'm going to take it. If he locates that slider for a strike, I'm sitting fastball again. If he locates a slider again for a strike, guess what I'm doing? I'm still sitting fastball. Hunter Green is not going to locate. Very few pitchers in baseball are going to locate three straight sliders. And that's the problem for Green is that he only has those two pitches right now. He did not throw anything else last year. I think he only threw 86 changeups out of 1,200 pitches. So when you're able to play the percentages like that, guys are just hunting fastballs. And even if it's 103, harder it comes in, the harder it goes out. And he misses over the middle at times. He gets that arm side run back over the middle. Guys aren't missing it. And that's why 11 of the 13 home runs he gave up last year were on that heater. And as we were talking about with Lodolo, he flourishes because of tunneling. I think Green suffers because he doesn't tunnel. The slider does not tunnel well with a four-seam fastball. And he doesn't – He you talked about the change of how it's developing, and that could be a plus pitch for him. And I, I agree. I think that could be a plus pitch for him. Um, and it's going to be necessary if he has that four-seam fastball change up with the slider to be another pitch off of that, yes. Because if it has the changeup to work off of, that's perfect. The other thing that I think could be could be happening with Hunter Green's fastball is something called a dead zone fastball. I was reading about this um, the other day. Um, the Iowa, Iowa College Baseball managers, they have like a huge analytics department there. And they do <laughs> a ton of like amazing write-ups. All these guys are getting hired by MLB teams now too. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> But I've they never were, even heard of an Iowa baseball player like ever. <laughs> no, but they have this, they have like this studly analytics team there that's like 10, 15 college kids. It's pretty cool. But back to what I was saying about Hunter Green, and he has the, he might suffer from something called a dead zone fastball. So that's a fastball that moves horizontally and vertically the same. So if it has 10 inches of vertical break and 10 inches of horizontal break, that would be a dead zone fastball. And if you're like one inch off, two inch off, that can, that can also impact it. Um, so I think that's something else that he's suffering from. The fastball is hittable because it's moving the same way vertically and horizontally. And it often, if you're not working down in the zone, if you're working up in the zone and you're a fly ball pitcher, that can really hurt you. And I think that's what, that's what Hunter Green's dealing with right now as well. A hundred percent. And again, like, that's why it, it's one of those things where, I mean, Jacob deGrom, his fastball and just his stuff period was, was not always this can't miss type of pitch. Like he, he was less than a strikeout per inning earlier through his professional career. Uh, and this is not to say that green is going to be Jacob deGrom. And it's probably not even fair to compare him to him, but in terms of velo ability and that kind of thing, I mean, there's not that many guys that throw, 99 on average that effortlessly. I mean, he would have been the hardest thrower in major league baseball last year over to Uh, If he's able to command it a bit more, then maybe there's not as much pressure for a third pitch, but I think he really needs it. When you talk about the movement profile, that's something that, again, you just kind of throw, throw and throw. And the more he does that, I think the more he'll realize like, okay, I need to tinker with the fastball a little bit this way or tinker with it a little bit that way. And that's the scary thing about green is he makes one slight little change and, and the floodgates could open and, and it's over. Um, and, and that's why, you know, when, when we rank these guys, it's like, I think on our top 100 prior to the update, uh, which was done in the middle of last season or towards the end of last season, it, it's Lodolo 14, Green 15. Uh, like, that's how close it was. I think it's going to be a little bit more separated. We'll probably have Green drop a couple steps just because uh, I, I do think that there's so many guys that performed so well last year that might get a slight edge. But I mean, Hunter Green is a pretty much a consensus top 20 prospect. And uh, the, just to wrap up on, on some of the details on Green's fastball, just so people can get an idea, uh, the opponent OPS, which, which I think is really surprising because people see 103, like I said, and you just expect nobody hits it. It's not like it was the worst pitch in the world. Like when you throw that hard, as long as it's in a decent location, you're going to be able to, to have some success. And to go over Green's numbers for the year, he still had a great year, right? Like 106 in a thirds innings, 3-3-0 ERA between AA and AAA, 3-6-5 FIP, a 1.18 whip. He struck out 32% of batters and walks 9% of batters. I mean, th this guy could go to the big leagues and, and hold his own. But that, that's not what we're expecting Hunter Green to do, and that's not what the Reds have Hunter Green for. They have Hunter Green to be a frontline starter and be one of the stars of the game, and that's what we're holding him to in terms of standard. Uh, and that's why we're being a little bit harsh. I mean, we could tell you about how hard he throws and how the slider is pretty good. Uh, and you're not going to come away here with, with, with any new knowledge, right? So uh, to wrap up on, on green specifically, 
762 OPS against that fastball, which, you know, there, there's a lot worse fastballs out there. But again, this is a pitch that is supposed to be one of the best fastballs in, in all of minor league baseball. And, you know, Ken Waldachuk is getting more swings and misses in, in the upper level of the minor leagues with the Yankees at 90 to 92 uh, on the heater. So it kind of just shows you how much just how it's just as important to have the right movement profile and have the fastball set the baseline for the rest of your stuff playing off of it as it is to just have a fast high velo fastball, right? Like it, you could argue that the former is actually more important. Um, so, you know, that that's something to watch moving forward. I think it, as he continues to improve the change up or he, it doesn't even have to be a change up Colby, right? Like if he mixes in a curveball, I mean, we, we talk about it. It doesn't need to be a fantastic curveball. Give that third speed and a third look that hitters have to think about. It might not be the best case scenario. Obviously a changeup would be the most ideal, but changeups are tough. If he mixes in a curveball and gives himself a third distinct speed, I think that could make a huge difference. And what my tweet yesterday was curveballs under 80 miles an hour, 290 Woba against. Curveballs above 80 miles an hour, 235 Woba against. So if Green comes in throwing a curveball that's 86 miles an hour, and, and it probably won't have the vertical depth that Max Freed's curveball does or other curveballs that are you know, to. slower. But if you have an 86 mile an hour curveball and say it's it's just a more depthy slider because his slider right now is at what, 90, 91? And it's yeah. almost a cutter. At that yeah. point, you're throwing a cutter. Um, so I think he could benefit from something that has more depth, more vertical movement, more horizontal movement, just more movement in general would help him. Um, and give him that third speed to full batters and keep them more on their toes. Because as you mentioned, guys are just going up to the plate and sitting fastball. And that was something that you told me about that MJ Melendez did last year. He was like, I'm going to look fastball and I'm just going to look one pitch. I'm going to expect one pitch. And if I don't get it, I don't get it, but it's, I'm going to commit. And that's what guys are doing. And that's what I talked about last episode with the breakout pitchers for 2022, like Tristan McKenzie, right? He's the guy that threw, throws his fastball 65% of the time and he gets beat because of that. Yeah. It, it's all about playing the percentages, right? I mean, and, and that's, that's really what it is as a hitter. If you allow the hitters to eliminate a region of the zone or eliminate uh, a velo range, you're giving them a, a much needed edge, right? We talk about the sinker changeup guys. If, if you're a sinker two seamer slash changeup guy with the majority of your pitches, I'm eliminating the upper third of the zone. And I'm just looking at everything down there as, as where you're going to throw it. I'm spinning on everything that starts at my knees too. Um, so you're able to kind of keyhole a little region there. You don't want to give, you don't want to allow hitters to use the process of elimination. You want to utilize the, the guessing uh, situation that it is for hitters to your advantage. And that's exactly what, you know, we're seeing kind of happen here uh, to Hunter Green. Um, so let's get to the next few prospects in here. Uh, but to wrap a bow up, actually, real quick on Hunter Green versus Lodolo, how far apart do you really think it is when we look at prospect rankings? You know, where, where are you where are you kind of tearing these guys? Um, is it still super close? Uh, wh- where are you thinking? Because for me, I, I think it's pretty darn close, but I still think it's pretty easily Lodolo, given what he's already done and what he still projects to be able to do with just the power mid 90 sync the nasty breaking ball, uh, a good mix of pitches and, and the elite command. I think Lodolo and Gray, Grayson Rodriguez are in kind of a tier of their own in tier one. And then behind them, there's probably a good list of six to seven arms that Hunter Green is with in tier two. Um, and that's not to say that they're not close, but I think that there's a clear tier one and Lodolo has that floor. But also back to what you said about Green, and he hasn't pitched much. And we've seen guys that haven't pitched much, like Otani this year. That's one name. Julio Urias hadn't pitched much either. We thought he's been in the league for five years, but he hasn't pitched much either. And, and once he finally gets those innings under his belt and is figuring out how to attack major league hitters, that's when things really start to come along. And so we, we still have to hold out for Hunter Green for you know probably at least a year or two before he's finally – settled in on how to attack hitters i mean you can't just throw on a rap soto in the back lots that's great to develop your pitches but you have to do it against real hitters too yeah and i'm sure you know when he's throwing on the rap soto everyone's like whoa it's 103 great job hunter and look it's even moving a little bit you're good you're fine um and, and for for a 
uh, you know, for the most part, he kind of was. But if we're talking about maximizing your success, yeah, you have to be held accountable by the competition. And I think that was kind of eye opening for him. He's still able to have success and be competitive. But, you know, there was definitely some eye opening components to it that, you know, will challenge him next year. And I mean, this is this is a freak athlete in Hunter Green. You know, he's drafted as a two way player. I'm more than confident that he will be able to figure out how to throw a third pitch. And then it's going to be much different. I'm also more than confident, excuse me, that the command is going to continue to improve a little bit too, because this isn't high effort fastball, you know, velo. This isn't high effort stuff here. He's going to, he's going to be able to, I think, come into his own and start dotting up a little bit more too. We saw that with DeGrom. All of a sudden he's able to pinpoint uh, where he throws it because it's a low effort heater uh, and the less effort, the easier it is to repeat it. Uh, but we're going to get into a couple other pitching prospects as well. And then also just the rest of this red system, man, like the, I, I was saying, like, I've, I've never written this much on, on a system. Uh, I think one, it's just because the more I do these, the more I want to write. Um, but also there's just so many like weird cases with some players in here where I felt like I just had, to, if I did not write enough, I, I felt like I wasn't properly conveying my, my opinion, because when you look at some of these players, like, Ellie De La Cruz, or even Austin Hendrick, because I knew people were going to be like, why is Austin Hendrick so low? Uh, and, and I'm doing his write-up because he's still a top 10 guy. And I'm like, people are going to just be like, why is he top 10? Because the whole thing was just pretty critical. Uh, but I, I just felt like I had to really dive into some of these prospects because the Reds have a really u- unique, but I think tangible approach. We talked about the Orioles in the past. The Orioles, through their system offensively, seem to go for the bat first or not bat first, I would say hit tool guys with power projection with the reds, they chase tools. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of that approach. I've seen the Marlins fail at that approach. Uh, When you're chasing all tools and not a lot of hitting ability, I mean, you gotta, you gotta find a balance between the two. But what I love is that I think the reds kind of acknowledged that in this past draft and went with Matt McClain, who is all hit tool uh, with with speed. uh, But I mean, that was a guy that was much needed in this system. And I think I got some questions as to why he was number three. And, and it was really hard to rank him against some of these other guys with way more upside. But Matt McClain, I look at him, I'm like, that's a that's a big leaguer, right? How good of a big leaguer? We'll see. But he's a plus hit tool guy, probably the only plus hit tool guy in this entire top 10. I, I know he is. One of the few in the entire system. And he can stick it short. That's what was most impressive to me. I'm watching the video. He can stick it short. The arm plays. But he can also play all over. He can play center field. He can play third. He can play second base. He can play either corner. I mean, he can play all over the diamond. I see a lot of Joey Wendell here. Um, and, you know, people are like, oh, Joey Wendell. If, you, if you're getting that out of your system, like people really forget how low the conversion rate is to Joey Wendell's in, with prospects, especially when your system is the way the Reds is right now. Um, and, and I think he can hit for a little bit more power than Wendell as well. Uh, but this was a much needed guy in their system. And a guy who really, really helped his stock uh, at UCLA. And Joey Wendell had like a four war last season. So mm-hmm. people need to, to get a grip on what Joey Wendells are worth in, in the MLB these days. But um, I mean, yeah, McLean's a guy that came from the Pac-12. Pac-12 is basically triple A. I mean, what would you what would you compare Pac-12 baseball to on the minor league scale? Probably not triple A, but like high a double yeah it's probably a, like, that that's the thing so I, I i always love that comp because i was talking to some acc guys and you know even talking to like griff about this and he was saying like yeah like it, it, the only difference is that you have some days where it's it's high school not high school but it's like it's like high end high school and then you have some days where it's like high a double a um yeah. whereas when you're in high a double a it's freaking every day high a double a and that's why the cape is so important but yeah the pac 12 was loaded and you know he was hitting against like high a caliber pitching on on several occasions and he was hitting in the cape as well and i mean that's kind of like that high a gauge as well i mean the pac-12 is loaded his team was loaded he he had garrett in 2019 he had garrett mitchell he had uh ryan creedler who's you know gonna get called up probably pretty soon with the tigers uh they had holden powell in third round pick of the nationals they had michael tolia who was i believe a second round pick by the rockies i mean this was a stupid team uh that's why people are like oh why, why didn't he play shortstop uh, the whole time because Ryan Creedwer was there and he went fourth round and he raked in college and, and McLean played center instead, then moved to shortstop once Creedwer graduated. And then that Garrett Mitchell dude slid in the center. Uh, so, I mean, this was a really talented team. And, and he, like you said, he stood out offensively and um, you know, he, he's a little bit unimposing physically. He's about 5'10, uh, 180 pounds, but 
the question, you know, the one thing I'm, I'm struggling with a little bit is, is I don't know how much power I see. Uh, but again, he doesn't need to be a 30 home run guy. And I, I feel like I need you to hold me accountable on this. It's almost like too natural of a thought, but I'm looking at a gaps to gaps, double guy. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe in Great American Ballpark, it'll translate a bit more. And I wanted to say, oh, yeah, look how it worked for Jonathan India. But Jonathan in India hit a majority of his home runs on the road. Um, so, you know, I can't really use that. Uh, but can that kind of help take a below average to fringe average power guy and, and, and put him a little bit over uh, the above average or a little bit over the average range and power output if, if you're playing in Cincinnati? The guy that comes to mind for me is Brett Gardner. I mean, Brett Gardner's made a living off of hitting over the short porch in Yankee Stadium. And yes, it's a little different at Great American Ballpark, but still the, the home run park factor there is, is unreal. Um, but yeah, when I think of, of um, him, I think, yeah, he's going to barrel a lot of baseballs. We talk about how high exit velos are all this, all that, and they are. But at the end of the day, you need to make solid contact and line drives, no matter how hard they are hit are going to fall in for hits all day long. And that's that's the guy we're talking about here in Matt McClain is the guy, and, you know, all over the field. He's gonna spray it all over too. I don't think exactly. he's gonna he's not gonna get shifted. He's gonna he's gonna spray it. And, and he's a very low key plus runner. So when you're when you're thinking we talk about high high Babip guys, batting average on balls in play, uh, because a lot of people point towards Babip and they're like, oh he's gonna regress. But you got to compare his Babip across years. And if it's consistently high, it's consistently high. It just is what it is. Like Tim Anderson. And when I look at a Matt McClain, plus runner, line drive guy, sprays it all over the field, that's probably a high BABIP guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And BABIP is a, is a function of line drive rate, of hard hit rate, not just Exeville, but like hard hit rate. I think that Matt McClain is a guy that's going to bear a lot of baseballs and hit a lot of balls that are 100 miles an hour for line drives. Another guy that Matt McClain reminds me of is a Marlins prospect, Cody Morissette. I mean, I think that's another guy – has plus speed, has a plus glove, can spray it around. If he if he gets bigger and and develops more power, then the sky is always the limit for these guys because they have that bat to ball skill already and the knack for finding barrels. You can't teach that always. A hundred percent. The one thing that stood out to me with McLean is that how little he does at the plate. Like he doesn't move. It's it's an upright stance. Bat's really relaxed. He just picks his foot up, puts it down, and swings. And he just relies on athleticism to hit the ball pretty hard still. I mean, he still hit three home runs in what was like 29 games. He hit, he hit a handful of home runs in college. Like he can get into baseballs, uh, especially when he, when he goes to lift them and especially pull side, I would say he's got average to above average power pull side. Uh, but I always wondered a little bit, like you don't want to disrupt a guy who has such a high end hit tool, has such a good ability to just put the bat on the ball, but he could probably get into it a little bit more. Like he does nothing. It's just, it almost looks like he's playing wiffle ball or like pepper. Uh, and, and that's something that, Cause I'm going to say the opposite very soon with a bunch of hitting prospects. So that's, that's the juggle. That's the juggle. And, and I'm usually a, a, a proponent of less is more, you know, just if you're a freak, especially though, like when you're the Ellie Dilla cruises of the world, if you, you could probably get away with not moving at all. Uh, and, and that's who I'm going to talk about here. And Ellie Dilla Cruz comes in at four. And this was the biggest, biggest riser from where I perceived the top 10 was going to be to where it actually ended up being by the time I was done with all of my video, all of my, uh, you know, analysis of looking at the batted ball data, the numbers, uh, more video, everything. This guy, to me, has as much potential as not only anybody in this system, but just about any prospect that's not ranked at the top of the top 100 list. It, he sounds like he's made in a lab. I had to double check like five times to, to make sure that these weren't weird, like I wasn't like perceived like video tricks on me or something like that. Um, Cause I, I need to go see this guy. Like, he's top of my list. Dudes. I need to see in person. Uh, but I, I really looked at enough from enough different angles. Uh, just looked at enough of the data where I'm like, okay, this is real. Dylan Cruz has a lot to prove obviously, but he is legitimately 19 years old, a switch hitter who is six two one fifty, which is nuts. Um, and 150, 150, yet he 150. posted exit velos of 112 miles per hour on multiple occasions over 110 on several occasions. And guess what? He's a plus plus runner too. And that one I'm positive because I was watching him motor on multiple triples and he's six, two, 
but his legs, I think are five and a half feet of his entire body. <laughs> like he's just like three steps to first three steps to second and they're moving quickly. It's and Slenderman it, running down the base. I path. swear it is, <laughs> it is the craziest thing you'll ever see. So you pair that with, okay. Plus raw power, right? I mean, like if he's putting up one twelves and he's the same weight, I was in eighth grade, uh, which I have added about 15 pounds since then. So it's not like I'm much bigger now, but my point is like, he's the same weight I was like in middle school. Like this guy has a lot of room to fill out still. And I think he'll still be able to carry it with his athleticism. Yes, we haven't seen much. He's only played in the complex league and a little bit in low A, and he's got one of the most aggressive approaches I've ever seen. But I mean, holy crap, like we got to watch this guy. Like, why are these guys not getting as much hype as some of the bonus babies? And when that kind of answers the question right there, uh, but that's something I'll get into after you, you, you mentioned some points here. Uh, I want to get into the signing bonus too. I don't even, I don't, I don't know what points I have here besides my God, those tools are insane. And, and a guy that, this reminds me of is Brendan Davis, a guy that you love is like these lanky dudes that haven't filled out yet, but have already shown that they have the tools to hit 112 exit velos. I'm for reference, I'm 6'2, 195, and I can, uh, there's no way I'm hitting exit velos above 95 miles an hour. So it's just, it's just insane to me that guys have that disconnection in their swing that they can get the power to hit 112 mile an hour exabilos without that much weight. Can you contextualize for the listener a little bit? I mean, I'm not expecting you to be like, oh, this is the X percentile, but but how rare 112 is in the minor leagues. Forget age, forget that he's 19 in a twig. How rare is just 112 period uh, in the minor leagues? Um, I wouldn't even say how rare is 112 in the minor leagues. The way to contextualize that is, how rare 112 is in the major leagues. I mean, most guys in the major leagues cannot hit a baseball above 110. And a lot of guys fall into the bracket where they're around 105 to 107 as their max. So when you're when you're talking about a guy that's 19 years old and he's already at 112, with if he starts drinking some protein shakes and getting in the weight room, which I hope he's doing right now, that is going to hopefully guide him into the 115, 116 range. And that's that's the range where if you're at 115, 116, you're in the top five percentile of all major leaguers. So right. crazy. And there's something I'm going to get into. Like, I'm definitely really interested in, in studying this a little bit more um, because there's a there's a, a little bit of a uh, it's almost counterintuitive. It's almost like a, a catch. I don't even know what, what the what the proper de- description of it would be. But, you know, you want to be short to the ball. You don't really want to be armsy with your swing. But a lot of these guys who, who are lanky and can stay short seem to produce the, the most insane exit velos. We, we talk about De La Cruz. We talk about Brendan Davis. How about O'Neill Cruz? I mean, O'Neill Cruz has, is the lankiest dude ever, but stays short. And I think there's something to be said about these guys with long arms that stay short and go to long. And it's just this natural explosion through the ball. That's going to be another little case study I'll do uh, because th- there's definitely something there. Uh, and, and he's another guy that has the ability to stay short. Uh, we're not even mentioning the fact that he like he's a switch hitter uh and and the in the swing from both sides is is really solid you know he he's one of those guys with a big leg kick at this point and i don't think he needs it and you can see when when things aren't all on time from the right side his big move is okay if i'm feeling rushed his front side flies open a little bit because subconsciously your brain's telling you if you're feeling rushed i need to get this thing out of here i need to get my hands out of here and that's where your hips fly open a little bit that happens from the right side from the left side not as much uh, which is good. Uh, we see a little bit of him wanting to go get it at times on breaking balls, but overall, I think the swing is is not bad yeah. given where he's at. The exit velos are really good, um, and and he's a plus plus runner, and he's got a big arm at shortstop because people are asking me, is he going to stick it short? Yeah, I think he is, and even if he doesn't, he's going to play third. He's got like a plus arm as well. This is kind of the tools across the board that people were talking about with Jason Dominguez. Uh, except he just doesn't have this physical imposition, but he's hitting yeah. the ball harder than Jason Dominguez did the whole year. So what's what's the point of the physical imposition if if it's not really accounting to hitting the ball as hard as some other guys? This isn't this isn't football, right? Like we're not doing Oklahoma drills at second base. It doesn't really matter how big you are. It matters how your strength translates to batted ball and. Right now, De La Cruz is putting up bigger, bigger exit velos than Dominguez. And I think that kind of puts things in perspective there. What do you think he was signed for, Colby? 
you're setting me up here, but I would say, I would say around a hundred thousand. $65,000. Yeah. Great, it's great gas. And this is something we'll talk about another time too, that I want to write about is, you know, obviously there's, you can go through it and you're like, okay, there's a bunch of the, the top international free agents were, were stars. Right. Um, but more often than not, the top three guys or the top four guys, if you have a better chance of getting a stud if you sign like six or seven dudes in the top 20 outside of that. Uh, and, and I think that's very clear and, and history will show that because you're relying on, on backfield numbers uh, from a, a lot of situations here where it's academies that are juicing it. It's, it's a money mill. There, there's a lot of things. And there's 16. Are, yeah. And there's a lot of things that are, that are kind of corrupt about the whole process. Right. And, you, and you're relying kind of on word of mouth being tipped off by certain people. You're not really getting to see them in games. Uh, it, it's a pretty crazy concept. Uh, the entire international free agent situation there. And it's getting a little bit better uh, because there's more academies down there from teams themselves. Uh, but the whole process through the years has really made it a major crapshoot. And that's why a lot of teams are, are very careful with how much they spend uh, and, and who they're going after. I'd rather get six or seven $100,000 dudes, I think, than, than one big guy, unless I get to see him in the context of just like a lot of games on a big level against decent competition, which is super rare. Uh, another guy who, guess what? Cheap bonus baby too, not expensive and... To me, I mean, if he did it over again, would probably be one of the more expensive guys in his class. Another outfielder I really like, our own uh, Jack McMullen, got to call some games with him on the other side and would text me after every game like, dude, you got to check this guy out. Alan Serda. Alan Serda is somebody that, you know, cracked the back end of our top 100 list. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of where Dilla Cruz might be in the top 100 update, right? I mean, if, if Alan Serda cracked our top 100 list and Dilla Cruz is ahead of him now, it's a good chance Silla Cruz is going to crack the top 100 list in the update. Serda had a great year. He is another really good athlete. He doesn't run quite as well, but he's an above average runner. He's got plus raw power, maybe even a little bit more than that. He really produced between low A and high A. This was his first look uh, above rookie ball. And he made some adjustments with his swing during the year that I really liked. Once he got the promotion to high A, much more in his back hip, a little bit wider, much more incorporated with the lower half and he can spray the ball all over the field. He's just still learning to kind of trust that he can do that. But between low A and high A, 250, 361, 523 slash line, 17 homers, 54 extra base hits, 34 WRC plus, 29% K rate, 11% walk rate. This is a guy I really like. And when you talk upside, I would say he's, he's second to De La Cruz in terms of what he can do uh, moving forward. And you talk about that, that transition from low A to high A, that's a big transition for a lot of guys. Um, that, that's a big gap between those two levels. And he actually lowered his K rate from yep. high A to, or from low A to high A mm -hmm. by 7%, 30% to 23%, which is huge. That's, that's huge. going from like your fringe, like striking out way too much to, okay, 23% is league average rate, very healthy with a 247 Woba, which for to give context to the listeners out there anything above 200 iso to, to 200 to 250 to 300 as you get into towards 300 iso that's really really beneficial for guys that means you're hitting with some serious pop and sarah has that pop yeah and, and that's the thing is it's we, we talk about this too right you and i as we create a, a player tool and a player evaluation tool right like you want to make a lot of contact that's the object of the game but there's less pressure on you to make consistent contact when your quality of contact is off the charts. See Tyler O'Neill, who Jack and I talked about recently, you know, on the podcast the other day in our kind of factor fluke player breakouts. Yeah. Tyler O'Neill doesn't make as much contact as you'd like to see, but when he does make contact, there's a higher interval of hit, if it being a monumental hit or a hard hit ball off the charts than the average player. And that kind of offsets it. So it's almost like this, this line you have to draw of, how much is he making contact? How good is the quality of contact? And at what point do they spill over to each other and one is leaning too far the other way? And, you know, that's something that you got to find out with Serda. But I like that you pointed out the high A thing because that was right around the time he made that adjustment. And I think that was a big, big component to it because he struggled at times uh, being able to, to kind of catch up to the velo. And he was really just hunting, hunting everything out in front of the plate. He hit majority of his home runs on curveballs, And the thing was, is that 
he started to hit velo much better as the year went on because he was preloaded into that back hip, didn't have this whole movement process that he has to time up and was more just reactionary. And I think that was something that he realized like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a beast. Like I'm strong. I'm big. I don't need to get into it and do all this crazy stuff to leave the yard. And he hit some moonshots. Yeah. He can potentially play center field. I think he's going to slow down a tick. He'll be a plus defender or at least an above average defender in either corner as if his routes continue to improve. Something that I love about Serda is he doesn't hit too many ground balls. He only hits 27% ground balls. And like you're maximizing that power in a park like Great American Ballpark. Um, now, is this a guy that probably is going to face a lot of shifts at some point in his career? Yes, but there's a lot of guys in the major leagues that have shown that they it does not matter. It does not matter if you shift me. I will just hit it over you. I'll hit yeah. home runs and I'll hit doubles. And okay, you can steal some hits for me, but in the long run, it won't matter. So I think that's a guy, Sarah is a guy that that's going to happen to, which is fine. I think it's fine. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was something I was thinking about. I'm like, yeah, you know, like he's going to want to always go pull side. But what I was really amazed with is I'm like, I'm watching a lot of these home runs. I'm watching a lot of these swings. And he, when he really wanted to, or when he was kind of forced to, he went yard oppo. Like he, he can let the ball travel. The path account like allows for it. And he, the ball is carrying to right center field. And I bet you when he gets the great American ballpark and he hits some balls that he thought we're not leaving the yard to right center and it leaves the yard. He's going to be like, Ooh, I can get used to this. And, and it might even have, have him continue to improve that approach as he gets older. Um, but I, this is a guy that I'm sure you're really excited to talk about. Number six on our top 10 here for the reds. This was another one that like this probably delayed the reds prospect top 10 by a day. Um, Graham Ashcraft. We had to like talk about him for a minute because he, he just didn't, quite make sense totally until you like he, he was one of those guys where if you just look at the surface doesn't make sense we had to like dive into it even deeper and he's fascinating I with him comes a little bit of bullpen risk uh, I think that's inherent uh but that is not a bad thing right like he could be a freak out of the bullpen I'm really still interested in seeing what he can do in the rotation uh before I, I toss it to you Ashcraft sixth round pick in 2019 uh he is a big boy he's maxed out at 6'2 240 23 years old, probably going to be 24 years old soon. Between high A and double A, 111 innings, three ERA, 2.86 FIP, 1.11 WHIP, and 28% K rate, 8% walk rate. What I really like is that the numbers continue to translate at double A too. Uh, he didn't really run into a wall or anything after he got that big promotion where there was a lot of good hitters over there. Ashcraft's fastball was something that we just had to like crack for a little bit. And we spent some time uh, looking at, how in the world that fastball works uh can you kind of explain our findings yeah absolutely you texted me with this movement data just kind of befuddled like how is it moving like this because it moves vertically downward a ton like almost like a two seam wood but it's but 95 it to 97 95 to 97 but it does not get the horizontal run that a fastball normally would it actually does not get any horizontal run at all it is literally straight as an arrow and my first thought was there are guys now in the big leagues and starting to these guys are starting to appear in the minor leagues that are having gyro balls they throw gyro spin fastballs and um Daisuke Matsuzaka a guy that came over from Japan and was a gyro spin guy my dog is appearing on the podcast as well oh there there you go There you go. For those on YouTube, um, a nice little look at the dog. I like it. <laughs> but uh, another guy in the bigs that is a gyro spin fastball guy is Phil Maton. I don't know if if you guys if you know who Phil Maton is. He was traded from the Indians to the Astros. He's a reliever, but he has a gyro spin fastball, and the whiff rate on that fastball thirty seven percent. So the gyro spin, when you hear it, goes well. That's not conventional because. What we think is you want the spin efficiency. You want 99 to 100% spin efficiency, which means it's moving perfectly backwards. This is the opposite. It's spinning like a football. That's what the gyro spin is. And so that's what Graham Ashcraft has, which is interesting. I am always in love with pitchers that do something different. And Graham Ashcraft is a guy that's doing something different and it's throwing hitters up. Yeah. It's got this like diving action to it, right? Where it's, it, it's, it's firm at 95, 97, but it still dives at the end. And that's why when I'm looking at the, uh, at the zones, 
right? And, and the highest swinging strike percentage by zone, you see 95, 97, you're figuring, okay, it's going to be effective up in the zone. Uh, no, I mean, because of the movement profile, it was disgusting down in the zone, uh, but he was actually able to locate it really well. And, and the thing with, with Ashcraft that is, is worth following is what we were talking about before, right? Like when you are a guy that only really works down in the zone, you're kind of allowing hitters to eliminate that upper region, which is an area where a lot of hitters are able to get beat today because of the high spin. But Ashcraft has commanded it so well, and also his, his breaking ball works off of it so well that, that he's been able to just make it work. He's going to be a reverse splits guy because of the way that it buries in on left-handers. And that was what was really cool, too, is that fastball. It starts middle in and then drops down and in and ties you up. And most, most pitchers are afraid to go down and in on lefties, right? Like, that's the sweet spot uh, for most lefties. But not when you're facing Graham Ashcraft, especially when you have to worry about this weird, slurvy breaking ball he has. Like, I didn't even know what to call it. It's like a power slurve is what I jokingly called it in the write-up because it's 85 to 88, tops out at 90, but has the movement profile of kind of a slurve, like a shorter slurve. It, it's, it's wild. And the pitch is great. The pitch is really darn good. And this is why he had such a good year. I mean, you talk about the ERA and the FIP. And, and he still gets swings and misses. And when we, when we finish this episode, I'm going to, I'm going to pull some stats of, I love the combination of the high ground ball, high strikeout guys. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's the dream. That's the literal dream uh, because when you're giving up contact, it's not great. That's why you see the fit in a great spot for Graham Ashcraft because even the contact is given up sucks. Uh, and that is huge. That's what Nicodolo does as well. The, the question for Ashcraft, and this is something that we don't really have a precedent for too much is can this translate second time through the lineup, third time through the lineup at the big league level? We're not totally sure, right? Because this is a two-pitch guy for the most part. He's got say, a curveball. Did you expand on those other pitches? Does he yes. have a changeup to go off of that? He has a changeup that he's dabbled with, but but here's the thing, right? And, and I thought about you when I was writing this up because you, you talk about this a lot, and your thing is like, okay, throw your best pitches more. Right. If you have mediocre pitches that are getting knocked around, throw them less. And that's exactly what Ashcraft did. His, his fastball is great. His slider thing is whatever that thing is, is great. And so when you have those two pitches doing well and the changeup is just not there and those two pitches are enough for you, why would you throw the changeup? Uh, and that's kind of where he was at. But I think there's going to be more pressure on that at the upper levels. But you look at the numbers in double A and, and they didn't even slow down a bit. So I'm very interested next year. I really am going to follow that. He could be one of those outliers that makes the two pitches work because one thing that stands out to me with Ashcraft is, and I don't know if this is intentional or not, is at times the fastball has more of that gyro movement, like you said. And then other times it's a little bit more of that traditional fastball or a little bit more of that arm side run. I don't know if it's intentional fully, uh, but I, I think it's enough to kind of give that third look if it is intentional. So now you're worried about the bowling ball. You're worried about the arm side running fastball and you're worried about the, the swerve powered miserable pitch that I would never want to face in my life. Uh, so that might be enough of that third look. If he spins a curveball in a couple of times a game, that's can stay in the back of hitters heads too. I'm willing to bet it is intentional. And when, if you have a guy that's able to control spin at such a minute level as Ashcraft is with, getting that gyro spin, then you should be able to know how to command that spin in different ways. Cause sometimes we saw that Ashcraft actually threw more of a cutter. Mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So he's able to vary that fastball from a cutter to more of a gyro fastball back to a normal straight fastball. And then you talked about the curveball had many movements, right? It was 84, it was 86, it was 88. So you're, it's not a two pitch guy. It's almost, he has two main movement types but there's different movements and velocities it, off of those it's pitches. lance linish kind of right except yes. with with a with a nasty slider uh but to, to wrap up on ashcraft let's say it doesn't work out in the in, in the rotation um but i think he's actually going to fit in really well with the ground balls that he gets I me mean, 60 percent ground ball rate uh, he should be perfect for cincinnati and i think he should be big league ready by next year uh, the command is is impressed me too i mean it's, it's good enough and i think it's going to keep getting better uh if he has to go to the bullpen that gyro and that slider, who does that remind you of? 
I mean, I talked about Phil Maton. That's who it reminds me of. But Phil Maton's a great. You gave me another like, name though. You gave me another name earlier, on the on the gyro on the cutter ish gyro oh, thing. Who did I give you? I'm I'm blanking. Emmanuel Class A. As crazy as that sounds, before you're like, yo, what are you talking about? The pitch profiles. I mean, we're comparing TrackMan data here. It's not just like, oh, what we're looking at. Like even it looks like it too, but but the TrackMan data is quite similar. And remember, I mean, yo, he's not throwing 101, but he's a starter throwing 97, 98 right now. If you put Graham Ashcraft in the bullpen, I can promise you he's, I don't know if he's hitting as high on, on a routinely basis as Emmanuel Class A, but he's hitting triple digits. I think if you put him in the bullpen, he's going in short spurts. And it has a similar movement profile. Graham Ashcraft could be an elite closer. And that's where you're at too. It's like, would you rather have a middle of the rotation starter or an elite closer? And that's a really fun debate as well, right? Josh Hader was a pitching prospect as a starter. Uh, and now he's the best closer in baseball right Both now. Are, right? It's like the, the Andrew Miller debate as well. It's, it's all of those. But that, that would be a great problem to have. Uh, and I think that'll largely just be determined on, on his starting pitching success. And, and that'll be something that's really fun to watch moving forward. Uh, let's move forward to number seven here. It's a guy that I'm just going to kind of run through a little bit because I wouldn't even expect you. I had to dig pretty deep for this guy. Uh, but I, I do like what he has going on. Uh, and, and I think that you could probably share some thoughts on just the athleticism aspect of it. Shocker, shocker. Uh, the Reds, after they picked Matt McClain, they said, nope, they're, they're just like, they were just fiending for a, a, a athletic first prospect. They go Jay Allen and, and Jay Allen, three sport athlete uh, in high school, which of course, very impressive. Started quarterback, averaged 14 points a game on the hardwood. And then also a, a really, really good baseball prospect was committed to UF number one outfielder in Florida and, and had strong numbers at the complex league. You know, we, we can't put too much stock into the complex league, but when you're a three sport athlete, who's now going over uh, to just playing professional baseball, that's a tough transition. He makes that transition. It, it's very polarizing with the multi-sport athletes, right? I mean, some of these guys just can't hit a lick um, because you just, you know, you didn't get enough looks at them and they didn't focus on baseball and it's just, they can't catch up. And then some of them, their athleticism just translates and they're, and they're incredible. I think Allen could be that guy because I was really impressed, even though it was 19 games in the complex league, I'm watching his swing. Like this swing is, is further along than Austin Hendricks was in the draft or even now uh, I'm, I'm pretty intrigued. And I just want your thoughts kind of on, on the three sport athlete type. What do you think of that kind of approach to drafting uh, when you're, when you're going after guys? Cause it's a little risky but it could pay big time dividends as well. I, I always like it because athletes are athletes and not just playing baseball is important. And a lot of guys will talk about this, being able to have those other movement profiles, not pitch movement profiles. I'm talking about body movement profiles. Mm -hmm. That's very important as an athlete. And if he, like you talked about, he was a quarterback, that's leadership. That's, you know, mental toughness as a quarterback, you have to be sharp in the field. You have to be sharp at the plate. He's probably a smart player. And that's another thing that's important to me. Um, so yeah, I love three sport athletes. And I think yeah, a lot of teams do too. Clearly he was a first round pick. I don't think there's much more to say than that. Yeah. No. And I love the balance there. You go McLean safe pick, and then you go upside there with the 30th pick. Uh, they had the 17th and the 30th pick uh, compensatory. Thank you uh, Astros for that one. Uh, Thank so you. That was a good pick. I, I like it. I thought he showed a lot. And, and you bring up a good point because I'm watching this guy swing and I'm like, I love his movements. I really like his movements. He, he, his issue was, you know, picking up spin. Okay. You know, God forbid a, a high schooler who goes straight into pro ball after playing three sports can't pick up spin. You know, he would drift a little bit and, and go get it. But he, I saw him run into baseballs. He hit three home runs that were monstrous. But the movements, the pre-swing movements, getting into his back hip, the, the mobility of his hips, things like that, that, again, is just you could see the multi-sport athlete aspect of it. And I think it's going to really help him out. Uh, another guy coming in at number eight that I was you know, really disappointed with. And I, I, I had some pushback of like, oh, why is he so low? Why is he so low? Why is he so low? Honestly, like it, I had to really think about it and say, should he even be in the top 10? I, my conclusion was yes, uh, because – He's so young and similar to what we were talking about with Hunter Green, even though he hasn't achieved success. Uh, one tweak and it could kind of come together for him. He needs a few tweaks, but that's the thing. Austin Hendrick 
His swing is so bad right now that if he makes a couple changes, it could change everything. Like it's it, just a couple changes. All of a sudden we're looking at a different ball player. Is it a swing plane issue for me? I, I'm looking at his numbers right now. And, and to me, it seems like it's a swing plane issue. I mean, the guy walked 20% of the time, but he struck out 37% of the time. And usually when I think of Austin Hendrick, I think this guy has big power. But to me, that had to be a swing plane issue if he was not making good contact, right? Can you go more into what's wrong with the swing? 100%. It 100% was. And, and that was the thing is I'm watching this guy swing. His bat speed's crazy, crazy bat speed. I mean, he's the type of guy that like in the finish of his swing, he's like whacking his own back because he has so much bat speed. But he grew up in the Pittsburgh area. There's not a lot of good baseball up there. And there's not a lot of challenging baseball up there. I think he was even saying the average pitcher he faced in high school when he was drafted was like 78 to, to 79 miles an hour. Uh, so you can't fault the kid for that. But remember, I mean, if you have otherworldly bat speed, you can get away with all the worst movements pre-swing in the world and you're still going to hit nukes. That's exactly what he did. And he struggled a little bit in, in the uh, summer circuit and some of the showcases. And still, you know, off of the tools that he has, plus arm, good athlete, crazy raw power he gets picked 12th overall by the reds Hendrick's still just 20 years old and that's why i'm not gonna i'm not gonna write him off but you look at his numbers for the year 211 380 388 seven home runs 23 extra base hits 119 wrc plus but that's really just buoyed by a high, high walk rate and low a 37.6 percent k rate here's the thing he doesn't chase much he actually doesn't chase much at all uh the problem is is his swing has so many moving parts that he just can't keep up uh, you go pre-swing, there's a leg kick, there's a huge barrel tip, and then it's barrel tip to arms. So it's a really armsy swing. And, and you know, you look at Barry Bonds, you look at a lot of these guys, they they really let their body take control and they keep their arms pretty close and, and try to just be as direct as possible. If you cast your arms out, it's impossible to control that, right? Like it, it, imagine holding a weight out in front of you and you're trying to control that. It's too hard. The closer you are to the body you are, the more control you have over your barrel and you look at Barry Bonds, he, he almost keeps it like close to his body the whole time. And that's why guys are looking to inside out things. Like you put the bat to your belly button and drop it at home plate. You have plate coverage from right there. Uh, and I think that's something that a lot of hitters don't realize is you drop the bat from your belly, from where you stand in the batter's box and let it go. And you have full plate coverage. So you, you don't need to, to cast your arms out so much, but Hendrick starts with his hands up high tips it over. And when your hands are like that high and that tipped, the first thing you're thinking is let me get this, this out of here. And I'm trying to get my arms out there. And when you cast your arms out, you slow down. And Velo was a problem for him. I think I had the exact numbers here. Yep. Here it is. 125 against fastballs, 93 miles per hour and above, man. That's what everybody throws as you get to the upper levels. What you that's can't hit 125, average, 93. Yeah. That's literally the average of the major league level. Uh, that's not going to fly, you know, and, and we saw the exit velos at 110. Uh, we see the bat speed. He's a guy that like could rest the bat on his shoulder and just basically swing like Matt McClain. And he's still going to have above average power. So that's why I don't want to write him off yet. But if you could tell by my whole breakdown there, that's just the tip of the iceberg of some of the issues he has with his swing. At least he does have good pitch rack. Uh, but at the same time, it's a little concerning because he's just not hitting baseballs, period. Uh, so I, I feel like it was fair to put him here because he can still turn it around. He's still only 20 years old. Uh, well, what do you think about where he kind of stacks up here in the top 10? I won't take it personally. I don't th I think it's totally fine to put guys above him until he proves that he deserves to be moved up higher. And he's only 20 years old. And so. In your next update, you're you're not gonna feel bad if he goes off this next season. You're you're comfortable with going with him from eight to number two if he yeah. deserves it. You know, I love so it. I don't think people should be too angry. I think people should just say, okay, he struggled a little bit. The tools are still there. We're not saying that. Um, he just needs to make some fixes, like a lot of uh, minor leaguers do. But being eighth in the system is not a bad thing. No, it's never a bad thing to be in a, be in a top 10 list. There are a lot, a lot of minor leaguers out there. Exactly. And you might be wondering like, oh, well, then why'd you go with Jay Allen? Well, Jay Allen hasn't, Jay Allen's swing presently can play. So I'm looking at that swing. I'm like, that plays. Like, we'll see if it translates. But when I saw Hendrick swing, I'm like, that's not going to work. And then it didn't work. Um, so I need to see him make a tangible adjustment before I bump him up. Allen hasn't proven to me that his swing doesn't work yet. And he needs to make changes. And he's also more athletic. 
chance to stick in center field, uh, that guy's going to get an edge. If Jay Allen struggles too, and, and, you know, we have a decent year from Hendrick, then, then we'll reevaluate it. So let's round out this top 10 real quick. And then we'll go through a couple names to watch um, starting with, with number nine here. And then we'll go to number 10 uh, Reese Hines, who I, I know that's probably a name you're familiar with a little bit because back when you were writing fish stripes with me, probably saw his name come up a bunch because Marlins fans really wanted him. He fell quite a bit because of some swing and miss concerns. I mean, this guy's six, four to 20 uh, ended up getting a big overslot in the second round because the reds are addicted to toolsy guys. Uh, that's just clear. And Heinz has crazy power. Another player where the context is important, right? Yes. He was drafted in 2019. Uh, yes. There was some swing and miss this year. He struck out 29% of the time. But he had three games, professional games under his belt before this season. I mean, that's nothing, right? Like he's played three games. He didn't play. He essentially never played professional baseball before the season and got the start right into after a handful of complex games went to low A. If it weren't for missed time with a bad knee, he probably would have gotten the promotion to high A. I thought he hit pretty well overall, man. Like two, I, I, this is the one where I think I might have, I, I still am thinking about it. I'm like, is he too low? 259, 332, 542 slash line, 12 home runs, 29 extra base hits, 126 WRC plus, 29% K rate, 7.5% walk rate. Uh, big, big time power. He's kind of your classic power versus whiff prospect. But he gave me some reason to believe that the power could prevail in the future. But I, when, when I look at power guys, man, and swing and miss power guys, when they don't walk, I think it really kills their outcome or outlook, I should say, because walking, how much, I mean, how much pressure does that take off of a guy who doesn't make a ton of contact, right? Like how important is it to walk uh, for these types of hitters? So, so, so important. I mean, Joey Gallo is making a career out of walking right now. Yasmani Grandal made a season out of walking. He walked 26% of the time last season, which is the highest since Barry Bonds. And I think he hit under 200 and still had a WRC plus of 160. So yes, walking is extremely important. My one, one question with Reese Hines is, can he play defense? And I haven't seen him play defense. You can probably give me more light on that subject because the bat to me looks great or not great, but he had a 263 ISO in low a with 10 bombs, a 120 WRC plus, which looks fine. It looks fine. I think yeah, first pro still 20 years old and, and looks like a bat that has the ability to develop, but can he play defense? Cause if oh. he can stay at third base, that's going to be huge. If he has to move to first base, you know, we always talk about if you're going to be a first baseman in, in the MLB, you have to hit at a well above average rate. And that's why that's why those guys get overlooked so much. And that, that's the really important point. And, and that's the reason why he's not higher, right? Because I think he can, I think he can be an okay third baseman from what I've seen. I mean, I only had so much to, to look at. What I do like is that he does move well for a 6'4, 220 pound guy. He has a big arm. I think worst case scenario, he could accommodate a move to, to right field. And be okay out there. So that's what gives me a little bit more options. And there's another guy that I'm real, I'm ready to bump up. I would say that 2021 was a net positive for him though, because he showed me probably better contact ability than I thought. And, and he also hit VLO pretty well. Uh, so I, I'm, I came away encouraged, but like you said, I mean, the, where he ends up is very important. If he goes to first, even if his numbers are strong, it's just too hard. I mean, you look at, we can find you so many prospects that rake that are first base only that just get overlooked. Uh, because there's just it's just too hard. I mean, the, the odds of those guys hitting at the major league level that they like to the clip that they need to hit is just very slim. Uh, Hines is a guy I'm watching closely, though. I, I like the adjustments, the simplifications he's made to his swing. I think that he's he definitely took steps in the right direction last year. He's going to start in high A and let's see how he accommodates that jump because he crushed fastballs, pulverized them. He held his own against breaking balls, but that was always the concern. And I'm kind of curious how that's going to look when he gets a better quality of breaking ball uh, when we move forward here. So that's something definitely to monitor moving forward. To me, this forward. is an outcome, a possible outcome for a guy like Blaze Jordan. Like these are very yeah. similar players to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And walking would make a huge, huge difference, right? If he's walking 7% of the time, you got way more pressure. We talk about quality of contact. Heinz is up there with, you know, isolated power on contact. 
Uh, that is important, but you put pre- you take pressure off when you're walking a ton, uh, and, and that kind of offsets some of the swing and miss. Uh, let's get back to a pitcher, and this is a guy who I, I was sending you a lot of his, his stuff. I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, a guy that I don't know if he's in a lot of the top 10s, was just drafted 2021 53rd overall out of UVA, Andrew Abbott, left-handed pitcher, six foot, 180 pounds. Not the most imposing guy in the world, but I like his stuff. And you, you look at this system and you look at any system in baseball, honestly, every single system in baseball, I think would take an Andrew Abbott, right? You're getting a guy that's guaranteed, in my opinion, to be a back end of the rotation starter, as safe to a guarantee as you can find. And also as the fallback of being a decent reliever, because in short spurts, he's shown that his VLO could tick up. At UVA, he was a Golden Spikes Award semifinalist. He was kind of 90 to 91. Uh, but when he got drafted, he was doing two inning spurts uh, when he got his little audition to just get his feet wet. I don't think they wanted him to throw too much after throwing a full collegiate season. But in his two inning spurt starts, he was more 92 to 94. Uh, that It's important to note that it was more like a bullpen outing for him there. And that's why the VLO is up. But if he can be closer to 92, 94, that's really interesting. However, he had one of the highest whiff rates in college on the fastball because of the life it has up in the zone and the way it plays up. He's got a really good 12-6 breaking ball that I think flashes plus. He started tinkering around with manipulating it to a slider as well so that those two pitches kind of work off each other. And he has uh, a change up with a chance. Uh, it needs a little bit more work, but it, it he shows at least some feel for it. What I was thinking about was that piece you wrote on Nestor Cortez, uh, because Nestor Cortez has made a living now on a fastball, 90 miles an hour, working up in the zone. And Andrew Abbott has shown through college. And, you know, the, again, this isn't it doesn't mean that just because it worked in college is going to work in the big leagues. But I mean, when you when your fastball gets some of the best whiff rates, I think it was the single best whiff rate fastball or, or at least one of the top three like top five. Yeah. Yeah. In college baseball. Uh, that's not a fluke, uh, especially in the ACC. Can you talk a little bit about how 90 to 92 can work from lefties like this up in the zone? And and maybe if Abbott could be this kind of guy. Yeah. So Nestor Cortez, Ranger, Ranger Suarez, Suarez, as you mentioned in the article as well, they can get whiffs at 90 to 92 because of the vertical movement that they don't have. Their ball does not drop at all. And Andrew Abbott is at, is in probably the top five percentile for vertical movement. Um, So you get that rise effect that we often talk about. But going back to you just describing Andrew Abbott as a player, right? Six foot, 180 on the shorter side. He has this electric low release because he's short, fastball with a lot of life, a nasty 12-6 breaking ball and a developing changeup. You know, that sounds a lot like Jack Leiter. Uh, that that sounds a lot like Jack Leiter. And that's if, if Andrew Abbott's even a little bit like Jack Leiter from the left side, I'm not saying that he is, but that just sounds a lot like that. And those guys are getting a lot of interest these days. We, we talk about something called vertical attack angle, and that is the angle at which the ball is released. And so a higher vertical attack angle will be a ball that's released like above the head. Mm-hmm. Now, Andrew Abbott has a very low vertical attack angle, which allows him to get that rise effect and hitters just do not pick up the fastball for that reason. So yeah. I'm very interested in this guy. And you brought up that the, this red system has probably not just 10 interesting guys. This red system has probably 40 interesting guys, because remember, this was a this was a minor league system and a minor, minor league pitching system that was led by Kyle Body from driveline like this it was driveline yeah. to the reds and like that had a lot of influence right but obviously body's not there anymore but he did a lot of good things for this pitching system in terms of them bringing in guys with interesting intriguing tools and things like andrew Abbott, where you're seeing low vertical attack angles high spin all of that stuff so there's a lot of interesting guys here yeah and it's funny you bring up the the lighter thing it it's that type of stuff profile. Um, and, and that's when, when, when we're saying, you know, Abbott can have success because he has that similar profile to lighter. That's what makes lighter. So elite is that he has that profile, except he throws 95 to 97. His, his breaking ball is a hammer and even more devastating. And then he has that same benefit 
of the low release angle, low, low release point and the stuff playing off of itself. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about, hey, Abbott can have success because he throws similar to lighter with much, not much less, but uh, I would say decently less quality of stuff. That kind of shows you how sick lighter can be uh, because, I mean, that's that's the crazy thing about it. But I see a lot of that like Suarez similarity too, where Abbott can get creative and change his arm angles a little bit. And I think that's why he's tinkering with that slider because the slider is from a different arm angle. And, you know, you, you got to get a little creative, but I think there's some pitchers in baseball that are, that are showing that it can work. And uh, I, I'm really excited to follow Abbott. A few names to watch moving forward, uh, which we, we added in the, in the bottom of the article. Ivan Johnson, switch hitter. Big time power uh, for his size, plus runner struck out 30% of the time because their system doesn't have enough of those guys. Uh, but I, I do think I've, Ivan Johnson is interesting, looked good in the Arizona Fall League. Matt Nelson, interesting catching prospect that they drafted uh, in the compensation round out of FSU. Uh, had seven home runs in his collegiate career, 74 games prior to that, then launched 23 home runs last year. So interesting guy to watch. The thing with them, with the Reds is they develop catchers pretty well. I mean, the, Stevenson, Barnhart, like they've developed their own guys pretty well. So that'll be interesting to follow. Uh, not to put you on the spot. Have you looked much at Lion Richardson? Cause I, I, I have felt not. So yeah. I'm, I felt I'm like interested. I was trying to talk my, trying to talk myself into liking him. Uh, don't love him, uh, but he, he's definitely enough to, to watch. I have one guy that I want to mention to you uh, because I'm seeing a lot of people really get hyped about him in the red circles in terms of what he could do if it all comes together, but he never really had any, and this is Bryce Bonin. He never really had any success in college baseball, um, kind of got knocked around and then still was drafted in the third round because he's a data darling. And I mean, just, just listen to this stuff though, uh, real quick. And then, and then we'll kind of wrap up there. 96 to 98, 2,400, uh, 2,450 RPMs, 21 inches of vertical movement, and seven and a half inches of horizontal movement on the fastball. Uh, most people just heard a bunch of numbers and, and we're like, what? But for you, like, what, what does that mean on that fastball? Because that, that sounds pretty lively. It's and lively for sure. Minus this, four this and a half a, vertical attack angle. This is a guy that was at, uh, what, Texas Tech? Yeah, I think he's another one of those Texas Tech guys. Yeah. So Which is funny because none of those guys pitch well at Texas Tech. And then they no. end up being good in pro baseball. It's so funny. Which is good. I mean, I, I like the development system of the Reds. And if he has other pitches then he has the pedigree already he was a texas tech guy even if he didn't pitch well in college they don't always pitch well you don't know what's going on with them some of them have injuries there's fluke things with pitchers you just never know what is really going on um but yeah bryce bond and i remember him when he got drafted i remember him in college being a top guy so um that's a good guy to not have in your top 10 and just be sitting there like, okay, he could break out one day and be in your top five. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think he's probably going to be a, a reliever type. His slider's nasty. Um, and, you know, he, he's got that fastball too. And that could be a nice little piece there. Uh, another, another guy that just kind of adds to the fold here. This is not as bad of a system as I thought it would be. Uh, I thought it would be more middle, middle of the league, maybe back half of the league. Uh, they're, they're, they're probably towards the, 12, 13 range, maybe a little bit better than that uh, to wrap up on, on the entire episode here. Where do you think they stack up? I mean, it's hard when you don't have everything in front of you. That's why people keep asking me, where does this team stack up? Where does that team stack up? And I'm kind of like, Hey, I love the question. I'm not, I'm not even saying I, I have an issue with the question. It's just, I can't answer that until I properly write up every single system, because this is a perfect example. As I dive deeper in and look at the depth it's not as thin as I thought it would be. It's a top heavy system, but there's more guys that I stay, look at and I'm like, ah, that guy has upside. That guy outside of their top 10 has upside to, to join their top 10. And when I look at all those guys, you know, I'm like, this is a better system than I thought. 10 to 12 range, maybe 13, 14 range. That sounds about right. Right. I would put them somewhere in the middle, but as you talked about, this is a, this is a system that has a lot of, you know, lottery ticket guys yeah. a lot of lottery ticket guys and that's good because at the end of the day lottery tickets do hit and if Just you have get a, a lot system of them. Maybe of, get a lot of them <laughs> if you yeah and they do so if you have a system of 30 40 lottery ticket guys you're bound to hit on some of them and i don't know what's going on exactly with the reds player development system right now because they're kind of going through a reshaping of that but I really did like what the Reds were doing there for a long time with their player development system. 
And I thought they were a smart organization and smart organizations are able to tap into players that other organizations cannot. So that is always a plus thing. And I think, I still think the Reds are a good player development organization. So yeah, I would put this, this system somewhere in that range in that, in that 12 to 15 range comfortably. Yeah. You know, I didn't used to have a ton of confidence in them developing hitters. And then, you know, I'm seeing Jonathan India come out and start to hit. I'm starting to get a little bit more, you know, Stevenson comes out and starts to hit a little bit. There's, there's some more reason for optimism. I love the McLean pick to offset some of those lottery tickets. I think you got to have balance throughout your system. Uh, and, and I would probably like them to go. They're probably going to go arm in this next draft because all of a sudden with Dolo and green graduate. And now you're like, okay, who's up next. But I'd like to see them go with some more college bats too, probably yeah. in the future. Uh, but I, I like the system. I think it's, it's solid. I don't think it gets enough, enough love. And it's, it's definitely not bad, but uh, by the way, a little teaser for the future. If you enjoyed this episode, we are well on our way to launching the call up, which will be my uh, prospect show on the just baseball. And what we call it the just baseball podcast network, I guess. Uh, and, you know, we, we've already talked about your fantasy show, which will be on the horizon as well. Uh, we're excited to keep adding shows to what we have going on here. Obviously that won't take away from what I'm doing with the just baseball show. Uh, it's more so just moving Locked on MLB prospects, which I've been doing for a couple of years now uh, over to our network. And uh, I'm really excited to be doing episodes like this a couple of times a week. Uh, keep an eye out. I, we can't figure out exactly the art for the call up. Like I wanted a, a bullpen phone, but I'm like, okay, that just looks like a telephone. How do you even know that's about baseball? And then everybody in their moms has the freaking podcast mic in their logo. So I'm not doing that. Um, so I'm kind of bugging out about it a little bit. Uh, but we should be ready to rock and roll come January. And it's going to be a loaded, loaded guest list. That's all I'll say. Maybe a couple of names that we already mentioned in this episode that will join the show. You should put your line. face on it. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that, I, that is one of those crazy moves, like getting to the point in your life where it is beneficial to your podcast to put your face on it. Like that's when, you know, you've made it. I, I haven't made it. Uh, so I, I, I'll do a silhouette maybe. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm there yet, but any ideas, feel free to DM me. Hey, you want to help me with my podcast art to hell? I'll, I'll pay you if I like it. <laughs> I, I've got, I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of things to figure out on that end, but always fun doing these episodes with you, Colby red system in the description, all the links you need in the description as well. And uh, really excited to kind of get going with more prospect stuff. You'll obviously be on the prospect show a ton. And I'll start writing up another system soon. Top 100 update coming in January. Any final thoughts? No, no final thoughts, man. I, I just hope all the listeners out there understand how much you know about these players. And if you say a guy is down right now or a guy is, has a ton of potential, I will listen to you because more often than not, and by more often than not, I mean probably 90 to 95% of the time, you are pretty spot on and you know a lot more than the average person about these guys. So I'll always, always listen to your take, but really appreciate you having me on and hope I was able to add some, some good context, uh, especially on the pitcher front. Dude, thank you so much. I didn't pay him to say that. I swear. Uh, I appreciate you brother. And uh, yeah, just so you know, anytime I have no idea what, what, the pitch movement on this guy, like how this works. Graham Ashcraft, for example, Colby's the first guy I text on that one. So I'm uh, really excited to kind of keep rolling with this. We're going to have a lot coming forward. Also real quick to tease the top 20 pitchers article that should be out within the next week, probably other side of the holiday after Christmas, top 20 pitchers in major league baseball, really excited to kind of see your list there and your breakdown there. I know you're putting a lot of time into that and a lot more uh, on, on the other side of the holiday where we ramp up the content on the website Screw your lockout. We got plenty to write about. Uh, but I'll probably talk to you all before the holiday. Colby, you probably won't talk to these people before Christmas. So give your Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll, I'll probably talk to you all with Peter for the Hall of Fame episode. But thank you, everybody. And I uh, look forward to talking to you one more time before Christmas. And hope everybody has a great holiday if you don't catch that episode before then.